Hello and welcome to our workshop on the translation and adaptation of psychological instruments such as scales, tests, questionnaires and other materials we use when conducting research studies. If you have ever participated in large projects where data collection happens in many countries at once or if you ever plan to participate in such projects in the future either as a project lead, translation coordinator, or a collaborator collecting data in their own country, you are in the right place. We will first talk about how instrument translation and adaptation is a hidden challenge of the big team collaborative science. And then we will provide you with tools and resources to ease you into this process. We will provide an overview of the main phases that we undertake when we want to construct a novel instrument. And then we will dive into the topic of instrument translation and adaptation. We will discuss the difference between these terms, uh, why measurement equivalence is important, the cost and benefits of adaptation. We will also introduce you to three popular translation methods and throughout the workshop we will provide you with concrete examples uh, from our own research experience. The last workshop section will be dedicated to how you should properly manage your translation files. We will talk about where to find existing instrument translations how to store your own translations so that they are kept safe, properly documented and available to other researchers who might want to reuse them in the future. But uh, first, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Alexandra Lazic. I am a PhD candidate and research assistant at the University of Belgrade in Serbia. I explore how people make vaccination decisions and how we can apply psychological insights to public health communication. I am a member at the Laboratory for Research of Individual Differences and I have participated in a few big team science projects. I am also passionate about open science. I am especially proud of our open access repository of psychological instruments in Serbian that I co-founded together with my colleagues at the lab. I'll talk a bit more about that towards the end of the workshop. And a hello from me as well to everyone, uh, wherever and whenever you're listening to this. My name is Danka Poric and I'm currently an assistant professor at the Department of Psychology, University of Belgrade. I teach psychometrics and a little bit of multivariate statistics, and my primary field of uh, research interests are personality and cognition with a focus on individual differences. Uh, I'm also a member of the uh, Laboratory for Research of Individual Differences, uh, which makes sense considering my uh, research interests. Uh, among my research interests are also open science, and I've taken part in several big team collaborations. Now, uh, in the next couple of uh, minutes, Alexander will give you an introduction on big team science and some of its challenges. Uh, then I will talk a bit about the test construction and adaptation, and then, then we will uh, jointly discuss the issues of translation. So let's first talk a bit about big team science. These large collaborative projects grew in popularity in response to the so-called replication crisis. This crisis reveals some issues in psychological science, such as problematic flexibility in data analysis, publication bias, and low replicability of research findings, which means that study often could not arrive at the same scientific findings as another study. So, in response to this crisis, big team science projects became more popular. They are worldwide projects involving collaboration of dozens of researchers. 
they also typically involve large scale and geographically distributed data collection or data collection in many countries around the globe. Big team science has brought about undeniable benefits. It pushes psychology to become more progressive, inclusive and rigorous, and it makes findings more reliable and generalizable so findings become more useful to broader, more diverse groups of people. Also, thanks to the internet, online collaboration is possible, so geographical distance is less of a barrier to collaboration, and science and project participation is more accessible to students and researchers from less privileged institutions. Across many fields of psychology, many research teams from many institutions have contributed to large-scale data collection. Some of those initiatives and networks are the Many Lab Projects, Many Babies, Psychological Science Accelerator, and there have been many, many more. There was also an unprecedented rise in multinational studies during the COVID pandemic. Researchers worldwide got together and had to organize and run studies quickly and efficiently so that they could address some burning issues such as vaccination adoption and mental health. Big team science is not as easy as it might look from the outside. Behind those impressive abstracts you often see saying that a study was conducted in, for example, 40 countries or with 11,000 participants is often a lot of hidden red tape and paperwork. For example, hundreds of ethics approvals and tens of translated versions of study materials. And this means that introducing even small revisions to the methods can turn into massive amounts of work. For example, if you decide to add a new question about employment or race, a large number of collaborators would have to seek ethics approvals again, and translation teams would have to translate new materials, and online surveys would have to be updated and repiloted. So, big team science projects are not without their challenges. And one of the big barriers is a lack of funding, um, especially if projects don't have any official funding. And they often rely on collaborators having to self-organize and pool and donate their time and resources. Also, researchers who participate in big team science often have little formal training in project management, human resource management, data management, translation coordination, survey programming. And all of these tasks and roles are highly skilled, but we often fail to place enough value on these types of contributions. For example, translating instruments or making the materials open access is necessary to produce science, so we need to make them more visible and more recognized than they are now. If we turn to instrument translation specifically, they also present a barrier. They are crucial when recruiting participants who come from different parts of the world. However, translated measures are often simply unavailable. So researchers from non-English speaking countries are usually responsible for this time consuming aspect of translating study materials. And not just this aspect, but also all of the other barriers I talked about are especially felt by researchers from the global South and Eastern Europe. So we hope that this workshop will contribute at least a little to overcoming these barriers. Now that we know uh, which barriers are often present in conducting big team science uh, projects, we're going to take a bit of a step back and talk more about the uh, 
process of, of test construction. Uh, actually, we will get to the process of test uh, adaptation and translation later, but in order to understand it fully, we need to understand how a test is constructed when we just start from scratch. So different authors pretty much identify the same stages in this process, and we will now go through them sequentially. So uh, we first plan a test, create the first draft version, then conduct a pilot study, evaluate the test, typically through doing an item analysis, and then create a final version of the test. And we will illustrate all of this uh, uh, through an example of a test, uh, or actually uh, a questionnaire, that is uh, intended to measure traditional complementary and alternative medicine practices, that is, um, how often, or actually rather, do people engage in practices such as homeopathy, acupuncture, Reiki, uh, I don't know, uh, herbal drinking herbal teas, uh, or uh, taking supplements, and so on. And uh, this uh, item uh, construction is actually part of a bigger project that both Alexandra and I are involved in with. Uh, it's the Reason for Health project, which examines the relationship of uh, health behaviors with uh, some uh, personality characteristics, uh, and we assume that the relationship is mediated by an irrational mindset. So let's go through the stages. The first stage is planning the test, and uh, that typically means uh, we first need to recognize that a new test is needed. So we, are, we first need to know what is the construct we're interested in, and look at the previous literature, what can we find, what has been done on this topic already, uh, what is missing, how are we going to oper operationally define the construct, what is the target population, and so on. So when we were working on this instrument, uh, we realized that mostly uh, inventories that target traditional complementary and alternative practices actually just target uh, participants' attitudes towards them, not actual behavior. And we also needed an instrument that would be appropriate for the Serbian population because there are some traditional practices that are typical for the Serbian and Balkans region that may not be appropriate for some other regions, so we just wanted to be sure to include them as well. And that's why we uh, thought that we would be better off making a new instrument than taking or adapting an existing one. So we started from the very beginning, and our target population was the, pop the general population of Serbia. So in creating the first draft, uh, this is like uh, the most creative part of the process, probably. We need to, of course, first decide what will be the format of our items. Are we going to ask participants open-ended questions? Are we going to provide them with a scale? What will be the scale of options? In which order will we present items to participants? How will we then later score them? And so on. And of course, we need to come up with items. So for creating the inventory of TCAM practices, this was really a very uh, interesting phase because uh, we actually learned about a lot of new practices that we hadn't heard about before. So we had um, taken information from several sources to help us create a, a good instrument. We of course reviewed the existing literature. We also performed a media content analysis. So we identified which uh, traditional complementary and alternative practices were, let's say, promoted in media. Uh, we also held two focus groups with stakeholders. Those were members of um, the official um, medical branches, in other words, medical doctors, and another one was conducted with practitioners of traditional complementary and alternative medicine. We opted for a checklist with several time frame options, which I will show you on the next slide, and we uh, ended up with a total of 71 items, which were ordered in line with theoretical modalities. Like, for example, we first uh, presented items related to uh, alternative systems, then mind-body uh, practices, and uh, bioenergetic, and so on. So the instrument looked a bit like this, only there were a lot more items. 
Uh, we ask participants whether they've heard about the practice, whether they had heard about it but never used it, uh, and if they used it, when they have used it, over a year ago, in the past year, or during the past few weeks. This was important to us because we wanted to assess at the same time the familiarity of different practices and also their use. And since uh, in the project we're planning to have ambulatory assessment as well, we needed to see which practices would be the most um, appropriate for this type of assessment. So we had this last category, whether participants used a practice in the past two weeks. So this is like just an example of, of the items that we had. Uh, after we have uh, completed wor the work on the pilot version of the preliminary draft version of the instrument, we go to conducting a pilot study. Uh, that means that we administer this first version of the test to a pilot convenience sample. Uh, what is important is that the sample is, of course, comparable to the target population. So if we're uh, if we want to administer the test to a population of adults, then we shouldn't administer the pilot to children or vice versa. And of course, we need to have a sufficient number of uh, participants, typically because we uh, want to do some factor analysis. Uh, we would like to have five to ten times as many participants as we have items in the, uh, in the instrument. Uh, of course, uh, it can sometimes be a bit smaller, but uh, this is the optimal number. So uh, we have pre-registered the pilot study that we wanted to do. We used a snowball convenience sample and we tried to uh, recruit uh, participants from different age groups and of different education, which we partly succeeded in doing. And our final sample is um, uh, 583 participants from the general population. After this stage, we go to the item analysis stage, where we check uh, the metric properties of both items and the full scale. We look at how, frequent, uh, how frequently participants endorse certain options, whether some items are too easy or too difficult. In this case, it would be that some items are just too infrequent or too frequent, like if nobody is using it or if everybody's using some practice, then it's just not very informative in terms of individual differences. We also look at uh, reliability, we look at the factor structure and so on. And this process typically uh, involves an iterative uh, pro process where we go through this uh, from different uh, points of view, where we try removing some items, then maybe we see, okay, we shouldn't have removed this one, let's uh, take it back and let's remove some other items until we finally reach uh, a version of the test which is satisfactory. As for the example we've been using, we're currently uh, in this stage at the time of recording, uh, so uh, hopefully uh, it, we will have a nice... Uh, set of uh, items for the final version. We are looking to shorten these um, instruments. Uh, and uh, we are thinking about having about around 20 items uh, because 71 is quite a lot and it takes a lot of time. So uh, the results are quite promising in that uh, even with a smaller number of items, we can practically capture all of the variance of, of the uh, variance of the whole scale. So uh, after we've gone through this uh, process of uh, deleting items, we just um, uh, create the final version of the instrument. And of course, the goal is for that to have the best possible metric properties. Sometimes also, yeah, I forgot to mention, we need to modify some items if we see that they weren't uh, maybe clear to participants, if we think they misunderstood what we meant uh, by an item, or maybe we decide to merge some items if we have one that is uh, fairly frequent and one that is infrequent and they refer to similar practices, we can also merge them. And through that we create the final version. Uh, and uh, that is also in progress. <laughs> Uh, so I, I first mentioned these five stages in the process of test construction, but there are actually some things that come later. 
So one thing is standardizing the test, uh, and that means we need to administer the final revised version of the test to a standardization sample, which is also typically used to obtain norms, which means that the sample should be representative of the population that we want to assess with this test in later uh, stages. Uh, we do plan to have a representative sample in one of the later stages of the project. So hopefully we will also be able to use that data to maybe provide some norms for the test that we are creating. And of course, what is also really important is to document this process. Uh, typically, uh, we either create a test manual or publish a journal article or do both of those things or whatever, just create some sort of publication where we explain to the users of the test how to administer it, how to score it, and anything else that may be relevant. Uh, and yes, uh, of course, for this example that we've been using, we do have a manuscript plant. So we've just gone through these stages of test construction briefly because uh, what we're more interested in is what happens next. So we've created a test and we've demonstrated that it has good metric properties that can be used. So then we can start using it. That's, <laughs> that's what we want to do. And uh, often there's a need to use the test, as we've seen, in different contexts to those where it was developed for. And we are specifically interested in situations where we want to use a test in different languages or in different cultures. And that is where we come to the topic of translation and or adaptation. What is the difference between translation and adaptation? Uh, typically, translation can be seen as one stage of the whole adaptation process. And translation is considered to only be concerned with lingu linguistic equivalence, whereas adaptation is concerned also with cultural equivalence. So if we were to graphically uh, show this, sorry, uh, it would look like this, where we have a, a smaller circle representing translation within a, a bigger circle that refers to adaptation. However, the line between the two is not always the cl that clear, and the relative size of these circles will not always be the same. So sometimes translation will be a very small part of the adaptation process, but sometimes there will be a lot of work invested in, uh, let's say, uh, doing a, a good quality translation that will then be very similar to what actually uh, we would call an adaptation. So uh, a first decision that we're typically met with is do we really need to do an adaptation or can we just translate this instrument? And the conservative approach would be that pretty much in any situation, the answer is we need to do an adaptation. So uh, Byrne says that a translation is adequate if and only if we are absolutely sure that there is a perfect alignment between both the measuring instrument and the construct it's designed to measure in the target country and the country where it was uh, developed primarily. And uh, the only way to know for sure that we have this type of equivalence is to test for it. And if we come back to what that means, we'll see that it pretty much entails the whole process of the adaptation. So uh, let's look at the stages in test adaptation now. The first stage is selecting the instrument that we want to translate or adapt. Sorry, in this case, only adapt. Then the second stage is translation. Next stage is pilot testing, then test validation. Then we have testing for measurement equivalence. We will talk a bit more about that later. Then we create the final version of the test. We standardize it and document the process. So maybe some of these stages sound a bit familiar to you, because if we compare the stages of test construction with the stages of test adaptation, we can see that they correspond pretty much one-on-one -on -one to one another. So in the first stage, when we're constructing a new test, we plan the test, we realize that a test is needed and that there isn't an available test that can be used. 
And uh, in test adaptation, we find a test that we think would be useful, but it's just not available for the population that we want to administer the test to. So that's uh, the equivalence between the first two stages, or sorry, the first stage in these two uh, processes. Then uh, in the test construction, uh, process we have creating the first draft version and when we're doing an adaptation we do the translation uh, so again we're dealing with items with uh, item content and format and we will talk uh, a lot more about translation later on uh, so I will just go uh, briefly over it now then we have conducting a pilot study which is the same for both uh, processes then we have test evaluation, item analysis, again, the same, completely the same for both. Here in the test adaptation uh, process, we also have something called testing for measurement equivalence, which is something we uh, typically don't have when we're doing a test construction, unless we're uh, creating a test that we know will be uh, administered to different populations or if we have uh, subgroups that we expect might differ on a test, then we also might want to check for measurement equivalence even if we're not doing an adaptation. So sometimes this can also be the same for both test construction and adaptation, but is something that is typically uh, present in the test adaptation process. After we've gone through this, we can create the final version of the test, and then afterwards we standardize it and document the process. So what is new uh, now that we're talking about test adaptation? One thing is translation, and that is uh, one of the, let's say, uh, that will be one of the bigger parts of this uh, talk. And another thing is testing for measurement equivalence, and we will start first with this, just to explain what it is and why uh, we need to think about it. So measurement equivalence, sometimes also called measurement invariance, means that the instrument has the same meaning and structure in different groups or at different time points. So it can be used in a number of situations. As I've already mentioned, it doesn't have to necessarily have to do anything with adaptations or translations. Uh, we can use it for different uh, ethnic groups. We can use it to uh, compare groups of different religions. Uh, to compare genders, or rather not to compare them uh, at the onset, but to see whether the structure of the instrument and the meaning of items is the same in different groups. And of course, if uh, we have a cross-cultural re research and we are using an instrument in different cultures and different countries, then we will also want to demonstrate that it behaves in the same way in all of our samples. And there are several levels of metric equivalence. Uh, which are typically tested through structural equation modeling uh, or more specifically confirmatory factor analysis uh, framework. Uh, we can also test for measurement invariance within the item response theory and then we're usually talking about differential item functioning, but we will now focus on the confirmatory factor analysis uh, model. So the process looks, uh, it's a process also that has several stages. We start from a very, uh, let's say, basic set of restrictions in the model and see whether the model fits well. If it does fit well, then we add another layer of constraints and again check whether adding these constraints significantly worsens model fit or whether the model uh, still fits fairly well. If the constraints worsen the fit significantly, then we just conclude that that's where we stop and we haven't demonstrated that next level of metric invariance. However, if we see that the model fit is still good, then we can move on to the next stage and the next stage. And we will now illustrate all of this uh, through an example. We will be using the individualism collectivism scale, but with a, a little disclaimer. Uh, the scale has four subscales, uh, uh, collect, uh, horizontal and uh, vertical collectivism and individualism. But for the purposes of this example, just to have a simple structure that we will be looking at, we will uh, treat uh, horizontal and vertical collectivism as part of a, a higher order collectivism factor, and we will disregard the individualism scale. 
So the model will look uh, like what you can see on the screen. And uh, this is a scale that we have translated within a psychological science accelerator project that deal with uh, moral thinking. Uh, so uh, we already have a translation that we can use. Uh, so, yeah, also another thing which is a part of a, this disclaimer is uh, we haven't actually done the um, measurement equivalence testing. So we're just using the instrument as an example. So any numbers that you will see on the following slides are simply uh, for illustration purposes. The first level of invariance or uh, measurement equality is configural invariance, which means that the model has the same structure in two or more groups, however many we have, which basically means that the construct has the same dimension, dimensions and is manifested by the same behaviors in both samples or three or more samples. So if we go back to this uh, structural model, uh, structural invariance means that in both the English and the Serbian language, uh, horizontal and vertical collectivism are part of the higher order collectivism factor. And also uh, we assume that each of these lower order factors has four items and that each of the items has only loadings on its corresponding factor and no cross loadings. So what is here uh, highlighted in red is the structure of this model, which we assume to be identical in both groups. So first what we do is we uh, estimate this model on the whole sample, and then we say, okay, now let's test whether the model is same in these two groups. If we demonstrate configural invariance, that is to say, if we demonstrate that the model really is uh, the same in both uh, groups, then we can move on to uh, demonstrating metric invariance, which refers to item loadings being the same in these multiple groups that we have. And uh, this means, in terms of interpretation, that all of these behaviors and items are equally relevant for the construct. So again, uh, made up numbers just for illustration purposes. Uh, we would need all of the loadings to be the same in both groups, but what, what does this mean? Uh, for example, if we look at this um, item parents and children must stay together as much as possible, uh, we assume, if we want to show metric invariance, that this item is an equally good uh, represent of the factor that it's supposed to uh, be a part of. So this item is equally important for vertical collectivism in both samples uh, that completed the questionnaire in the English language and those who completed it in the Serbian language, or rather, it should be the same in, let's say, United, the United States and Serbia. And the same goes for any of these items. So each of them needs to be equally important for the construct in both or three or five groups, however many we have in a particular study. If we can demonstrate that this is indeed the case, then we can move on to the next stage of scalar invariance, which assumes that item intercepts are also the same between groups. That means that any mean differences between items are actually the consequence of differences in uh, latent factors, latent constructs, and not some item-specific content. So again, maybe it will be easier if we go through an example. Uh, so, for example, this last item of, vert of vertical collectivism, it is important to me that I re respect the decisions made by my groups. If we find differences in the mean values of, these, uh, of this item in the two groups, there are two possible explanations. One explanation is that uh, people in one group are just higher on vertical collectivism compared to the other group. But in order to be sure that that is the case, we need to demonstrate that it's not the other interpretation, which would be that people in one culture simply find uh, endorse this item more frequently, just agree with it more. 
And uh, if they do agree with it more, then we would get different intercepts in these two models. If the intercept is the same, that means we can compare groups on the levels of the latent construct. So that's what scalar invariance is. And finally, uh, this and this is the last step, which isn't always performed because it isn't necessary for comparing groups in the level of the latent variable. We can also check for residual uh, variance. Uh, when we say residual, we mean uh, error and specific variance taken together, which is again assumed to be equivalent across groups. So now we're looking at these uh, residual terms that are associated with each manifest variable in the model. And again, we are adding constraints to the model uh, so that residual uh, variances are the same across both uh, groups. So in each of the models, we kept all of the uh, restrictions and constraints of previous model and just added on and built more and more um, constraints uh, onto the model. And as I mentioned, of course, it is possible that sometimes we just don't find evidence of uh, equivalence at a certain level. So uh, as we've seen, this is a step-by-step -step process where we add constraints to the model to demonstrate higher and higher levels of metric equivalence or invariance. As I've already mentioned, if we want to perform group mean comparisons, which we sometimes do, not always, we should definitely test for structural, metric, and scalar invariance, and testing for residual invariance is not necessary. However, however, often it happens that we can only demonstrate partial equivalence. Uh, what does that mean? That means that, for example, we uh, see that there are indeed uh, differences in intercepts, but not for all items, maybe just for one or two items. Then we release these constraints and say, okay, we're constraining all of the loadings and all of the intercepts, except for these two items, to be the same across groups. And if we demonstrate that such a model fits well to the data, then we can say that we have provided evidence of a partial metric equivalence uh, or scalar equivalence. So uh, the only question is, how many are we allowed to release? And that is uh, a question which doesn't have a, a very clear-cut answer. Uh, and more research is definitely needed so that we can empirically support any decision that we make. But like a rule of thumb would be not too many, which is typically the rule of thumb when you need to make uh, any model modifications. So uh, to sum up, uh, we should never just assume that we can obtain measurement invariance when we're using an instrument in a different culture or in a different language, in a different ethnic, religious group, whatever. For some instruments, uh, we do have evidence of uh, structural, metric, sometimes even scalar invariance. So uh, for personality traits measured by the big six hexaco model, there is uh, evidence of uh, metric invariance across a number of countries, which again, if we look at the construct, uh, should make sense because personality traits are not that directly uh, rooted in culture. They're just um, more an aspect of individual differences and not so much of group differences. While on the other hand, if we look at uh, a scale such as the family, family value scale, uh, which we would assume is more culturally specific. Uh, the authors could only demonstrate structural invariance, and uh, as for metric invariance, only partial metric invariance. So knowing this, what can we do to maximize our chances of obtaining measurement equivalence? Well, we can go back to the start and uh, see what was the other stage that we mentioned was also important, and that is translation. So one good way to assure that there's uh, a significant amount of overlap in both the construct and item content between the original and the translated and adapted version of the instrument is to do this translation phase 
um, thoroughly and with uh, care uh, and uh, attention. So even when we're just talking about the translation phase of the adaptation, it can really involve a wide range of options from some very minor to some major changes in item context. So sometimes the overlap between the original and the translated version of the instrument is very high, and sometimes we will see that they differ quite significantly. So what do we need to take into account when we're thinking about translation? Uh, it is very important to be aware of different sources of bias. Uh, which actually make this difference between simply linguistic equivalence and measurement equivalence, which we wish to achieve. So uh, one of these sources of bias, there are three, is construct bias. So uh, if we talk about collectivism and individualism, do we assume that these constructs are understood in the same way in both cultures, the original culture where the instrument was developed and the target culture for which we are translating and adapting the instrument. So that is the first thing to consider. Next is the method bias. Are participants in both cultures equally familiar with the assessment method? So if we're presenting them with a liquor type scale, is that something that's equally familiar to uh, participants in both groups? Do they know how to respond to such items? So we just need to uh, take this also into consideration. Uh, we can maybe interview a couple of um, potential participants, laypersons, lay to see how they understand items if they're presented in one or another way. And finally, of course, we have the item bias, which refers to specific item content. So sometimes the wording might need to change. Sometimes the things we refer to in the items are just not appropriate in another culture. So this is all something that we need to be aware of uh, when we're uh, conducting a translation. And uh, as we will see, some translation procedures actually take some of these forms of bias into consideration uh, just through their, uh, the way that the process should look. And uh, sometimes additional steps are required. And now Alexandra will give you a brief overview of different translation methods. We will first cover two popular translation methods. One consists of translating and then back translating an instrument, and the other method consists of parallel translations. And then we will talk about a more complex translation procedure developed by the Psychological Science Accelerator. The translation and back translation method is also called the forward-backward procedure. This method requires at least two persons to be involved. One person first translates the items from the source language to the target language, for example, from English to Serbian, and then a second person independently translates the items back into the source language, so from Serbian to English in our example. And as a third step, we compare the original items with the back translated items to see if anything important was changed in the translation and to reconcile any differences that appear. Uh, we apply this method to translate a scale that measures vaccination readiness and the author of the original scale was the one who compared the original version with the back translated version. We then discussed why some discrepancies, differences appeared, and finally the author approved our translation. Another popular translation procedure is called the parallel translation. It again requires at least two or three persons to be involved. As a first step, two persons produce two independent translations. 
Then, during the revision phase, translators and the translation coordinator, for example, can reconcile discrepancies. They should now also agree on a final version. So, either a version that combines the best parts on the independent translations, or the version that appears in the course of the discussion. And the final translation method that we will show you now is the Psychological Science Accelerator translation process, which is so complicated that we needed three slides to give it justice. Uh, jokes aside, uh, it's not actually that complicated in that it's intuitive and uh, the stages make sense, but there are definitely a, a couple more stages compared to previous translation procedures. So we first start, like in any other translation, with the original version. And uh, we will illustrate this process uh, uh, by using the items from the Oxford uh, Utilitarianism Scale, which was also translated for the Psychological Science Accelerator 6 project, Moral Thinking Across the World. Uh, so we actually, uh, members of the team, uh, of the Serbian team for this um, project, we went through this procedure following these uh, steps. So we started from the original English version, uh, and uh, this is just an example of one item. Of course, the same procedure was applied to all items and to instructions and response case. So uh, we have two independent translators that do the forward translation from the English language to the Serbian, uh, which means that we get two different translations, which are called translation A1 and translation A2. These two translations are then compared and result in a final A version. So, since we have a lot of items, for some items we will choose the translation of translator A, sometimes we will choose the translation of translator B as the one that sounds more natural. Sometimes we'll, which is the case for this item here that you have uh, on the slide, sometimes we will make a third version which combines the, the two translations which we think uh, would just feel the most natural to Serbian speakers. So uh, this comparison of the two stages is done by both translators A1 and AB, but also there is a person who is called a language coordinator, and that person is also involved in this comparison and in making decisions regarding the final version A. After we have the final version A, we then back translate it to English uh, twice. We have, again, two translators, but these are two different people. So it's a person B1 and B2, and they make translations B1 and B2, which again will never be, or practically never be identical. And then based on the differences in translations, a comparison is made, and then the final B version is created, which is, since now this is a back translation, in English. So that is the next big step in the process. And in this comparison, uh, both uh, B translators and the language coordinator take part and discuss any differences and anything they think might need to be additionally changed. So here we uh, took uh, this uh, translation B2 as the one that will be the final B translation because it sounded uh, a bit more natural. In the next stage, we compare the back translation with the original version to see whether there are any significant changes in item meaning and uh, if there is anything that's problematic, then we go back to the version A, to the translation, and maybe see if another translation captured the original meaning better, or maybe we need to uh, create a, a completely new uh, version of the translation, so that we, uh, at the same time, try to uh, not necessarily replicate the wording of the original item in English, but simply to capture the meaning of that item in the English language in such a way that would be also meaningful in the Serbian language. And after we've done this, so after we have compared the original with this back translation, which is called version B, uh, 
we get to version C, which is the Serbian version that we think is the most appropriate to convey the meaning of the uh, items or, or a specific item. Uh, after we have done that, we have another stage where the translation is sent to external readers. They are non-academics who are fluent in the uh, language to which the scale is being translated. In this case, Serbian native speakers. Uh, we, I think, recruited even more than two. Uh, so two is a minimum. If you can find more people to just go through the items and note any comments and questions that they have, that's very useful. And after revising uh, their comments, uh, you will be able to create the final version of the translation, which is called version D. So as we've seen, there are five steps of the process. First, we have two A translators that independently translate and create version A in discussion with the language coordinator. Then we have two B translators that independently back translate the uh, version A and then create uh, final version B in discussion with, again, with the language coordinator. Then all of the translators and the language coordinators discuss the differences between the back translation and the original and create version C of the translation. Uh, then uh, this is sent out to uh, external readers. Their comments are acknowledged. And finally, uh, another stage is that members of the research team, uh, here they're referred to as uh, data labs uh, that do data collection. Uh, they also check if there are any additional uh, changes that need to be made that will make the instrument more culturally appropriate or that will ensure that the construct that is intended to be measured is captured more precisely. So overall, we have five stages of the process. At least seven persons are involved. There are a total of eight versions of the translation that get created during the process, and the translators need to meet and compare these versions at least four times. So it is quite demanding. So based on everything we've said, we can see that there are some clear advantages of this process because it combines the best bits of both the parallel and the back and uh, forward uh, translation procedure. And it also includes this cultural adjustment component uh, through recruiting external readers and also uh, it's a process. It's a part of the process that data labs also check. Uh, data collection labs also check for meaning. But of course, the downsides that go with all of these advantages are that this is a, a more complex procedure compared to the previous two, and that it requires more resources uh, in terms of people involved, time, organization, and so on. So, how can we make these downsides a bit more manageable? Well, first of all, there's a, a very good step-by-step -step explanation of the process on the Psychological Science Accelerator website. Uh, what we used and what is uh, quite efficient is to use tabbed spreadsheets uh, with clearly labeled columns for each version of the translation, with the columns for comments, for discussion, uh, and just following the order of the tabs in the spreadsheet can really ease the process very much and make uh, the final product uh, also understandable to someone who hasn't been involved in the translation process. As for the resources, part of the, uh, the problem with this uh, translation procedure, well, if we want to save time and uh, human resources, then we could consider subcontracting some translation services. And there are also already some uh, collaborations with Psychological Science Accelerator planned. Uh, but again, this uh, requires resources of a different kind. So in any way, what will make the procedure easier is to just plan for this when planning the whole project. So this is maybe a note for project uh, leads more than for data collection labs. But always be sure to uh, allow for enough time and enough uh, 
funds to actually do the translation uh, well, because depending on how well the translation is done, uh, the results will be uh, more reliable or not as reliable. Uh, and now Alexandra will tell you a bit more about what it takes to make a good translation. So if we want our translation to be good, we should think about who the translators should be or what minimal requirements they should fulfill. Naturally, translators should be fluent in both the source and the target language of an instrument, but they should also be knowledgeable about the content of the instrument, about the construct the instrument measures. And translators should be familiar with the cultures of both languages. Of course, it would be ideal if a translator met all of these criteria. However, it is more realistic that a, translator's, uh, that a translator meets only one or two of these requirements. So when choosing translators for a project, we should just make sure that all of these criteria are taken into account. So this could, for example, mean that two or three persons each meeting one or two of the criteria are selected to make a translation. Another very important thing to keep in mind is that you should avoid literal translations. So even though a literal translation would match the original wording better, when we compare the two during the translation procedure, you should avoid word-by-word -word translations at all cost. Such translations will just sound unnatural and can also have serious consequences. So when you translate an instrument, pay attention to the linguistic features. One common mistake is to keep some features of the source language such as grammar or spelling, that are simply alien to the target language. And also pay attention to the idioms, as well as to the culture and the context. And I'll now illustrate why context and idioms are important. This is an item from an inventory of personality organization. It says, I'm a hero worshipper, even if I am later found wrong in my judgment. And researchers wanted to translate this inventory into Brazilian Portu Portuguese, but instead of retaining the expression, I'm a hero worshipper, they changed it to, I idolize some people. Because in fact, the term hero worshipper has uh, no clear meaning in Brazilian, Portuguese, and in other languages. So because they adapted the item this way, it is more likely that it will be adequately understood and answered by Portuguese language participants in Brazil. So the items do not need to remain literally identical it is much more important for the items to retain the same meaning and conceptual equivalence. And you can only achieve this if you take the cultural context into account. We will now provide you with a few more examples to illustrate how the translation and adaptation procedure can look like in the wild. First, Here's an example from a recent large-scale project on temporal discounting. The lead researchers developed an instrument to study a phenomenon where people tend to prefer smaller and immediate rewards over larger but delayed ones. This instrument contains a list of binary items where participants have to choose whether they would rather receive some amount of money today or a larger amount of money in 12 months. This research project was conducted in 61 countries 
and the instrument had to be adapted for each one of those countries. To do so, we had to find information on the average income in a country and then use that information to adapt the monetary values appearing in the questions. We also had to apply local standards when it comes to the reporting of race, education and employment status. So for example, instead of race categories for a country such as Serbia or uh, Montenegro, we used ethnicity categories. And in addition to all of these adaptations, researchers from non-English speaking countries had to apply the forward and back translation and involve at least one native speaker in this process. And another example from the PSA 6 Moral Thinking Across the World study, uh, we not, we're not always translating items. Sometimes we have different types of materials that we need to translate. So for example, we had these images that are um, used as part of uh, what is presented to participants, uh, along with explanations of what is going on in a situation. Uh, and we needed to translate them as well. So uh, in a technical sense, this also requires working in some image editing programs, uh, which again, if you're using this type of material and you're a project lead, uh, just have in mind that data collecting labs will either need help with this or uh, they will need to be uh, knowledgeable in using these types of programs. Uh, but talking about translation, even though it seems pretty basic, we just have a couple of single words or two or three words uh, that refer to what is shown in the image. Actually, we needed to do a bit of adaptation here as well. For example, uh, even though the original problem is called the trolley problem, uh, trolley buses in Serbia don't go on tracks. They uh, just uh, are buses with trolleys attached to them. So what would be meaningful would be to use the word tram. So we translated the trolley problem as the tram problem, which is how it's also sometimes called in the literature in the Serbian language. Uh, and also uh, calling the person involved Joe uh, wouldn't really work, of course, for the Serbian population because this is not a Serbian name. So we adapted it to a similar name with the same root, uh, Jov. Uh, and in another example where we uh, really needed to do uh, quite an extensive um, adaptation, was the Harvard Trauma Questionnaire. This is uh, an instrument that is um, created for the assessment of traumatic events that different groups, uh, mostly refugees, have been exposed to uh, and uh, that they have experienced uh, in a prolonged period of time, mostly in their country of origin. Uh, so naturally, not all items will be relevant for all contexts. And uh, in the instrument manual, it is explicitly stated that if you want to use it for a population that it hasn't been used uh, for before, you need to do an adaptation. So uh, with my colleagues, we uh, adapted part one of the Harvard Trauma Questionnaire for refugees uh, seeking asylum in Serbia. Uh, and uh, in the first part of the adaptation, we conducted a total of 16 focus groups with uh, 80, 78 refugees and additional three interviews with participants who weren't that comfortable talking in uh, small groups and wanted to be uh, alone with the interviewer when sharing their personal experiences. So uh, focus groups were organized in two phases. In the first phase, we uh, presented participants with some existing items and asked them to uh, see whether that content was relevant for them, whether there were some items that were just not meaningful for their countries of origin, whether some could be relevant if modified, and whether some additional items are needed that weren't covered by what was already uh, uh, existing in, in existing instruments. So after this phase, we uh, took all that information into account and uh, created 
a new revised list of items that was then presented to participants uh, in focus groups in phase two. And these participants uh, helped us additionally clarify item content, but also the helped us uh, create the final phrasing of items so, so that they're understandable to all participants. And in a later stage, we administered the, uh, the instrument to uh, a fairly large sample of asylum seekers who are uh, seeking asylum in Serbia. We, of course, performed all of those steps that we mentioned before, a detailed item analysis, and the shortening of the instrument for future use, after which a publication was made. So after everything that we've talked about, uh, one big question is like, when can we stop with doing translation and adaptation? So on the one hand, we know what is ideal. It's to go through all of those steps that we've listed before. But on the other hand, we need to consider also what is feasible, especially in uh, big team projects where we have deadlines and uh, limited funding. So uh, what we know uh, when we're comparing translation and adaptation, as well as different procedures for doing just the translation, uh, the more uh, resources and the, the more funds go into something, the better the quality. That's typically the case in other situations as well. But we can wonder whether this correlation is really perfect. Uh, sometimes in the real life situations, we know that huge differences in cost are actually related to just small differences in quality. So the, the issue is, you know, when when can we be satisfied enough with the resulting translation or adaptation of an instrument? And this is actually an empirical question. However, most of the answers to the question rely on some theoretical and logical arguments. And the advantages and disadvantages of different methods are typically discussed in these terms. So uh, doing more research on this topic and comparing translations resulting from different procedures would be a very useful insight that could help us uh, gauge like what, what is the optimum between investing a lot of time and resources uh, and uh, investing as little as possible to get a, uh, a usable output. So uh, as we mentioned in typical, in big science, uh, big team science projects, adaptations are not typically planned for. We only do the translation. And then maybe if uh, specific countries want to do an adaptation of a translated instrument, that's usually a different study and it's just uh, done locally. But we do have data uh, that we can use to perform secondary data analysis and compare translations to original versions of the instrument or test for metric invariance and uh, whatever else we think uh, could be tested. <coughs> so there is one study that actually compared uh, translations and original instruments uh, based on the data from the Many Labs uh, 2 project. And they found that translations were slightly less reliable. However, due to small sample sizes, uh, they couldn't test for significance of these differences. But what is also is important is that translations were generally administered to smaller samples. So, uh, and we know that sample size is related to reliability, uh, which means that perhaps if we could control for sample size, that uh, the reliability of translations would be on a similar level, I mean, it, it already was, there were really just slight differences in favor of the original versions. But if we could show that these instruments are equally reliable, both when used in their original form and when used in a translated form, that would be a, a big step forward. And also what we always need to take into account is the intended use of the instrument, or rather what is our study goal? When we talked about metric uh, measurement invariance, we said that if we want to compare countries in mean scores, we need to be confident that we have scalar invariance 
uh, which means that groups only differ in how much uh, of the latent construct the groups have and not which specific behaviors are more common or less common in different countries. But if we're not interested in comparing group means and we're just interested in the relationships between variables, then metric invariance could be sufficient. Again, uh, if we're not just talking about big team science projects and we're talking about just doing a translation adaptation for use in one country only, then of course, depending on what the instrument will be used for, we might have um, uh, stricter or less strict requirements. So uh, if we want to use a test in clinical settings where we compare the scores of a participant with uh, what we expect for the population, then we, of course, would need to have norms and standardize the test. But if we're just interested in relationships with other variables, uh, then it might be sufficient to just have metric invariance. An important footnote in this workshop is that you should check if the instrument has already been translated before you decide to make a translation yourself or invite other researchers to do it. You can check some repositories or online archives that hold this type of research data. There are uh, not as many repositories that hold instrument translations and adaptations, but the ones listed here can still provide useful information to you. There are repositories by the Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences and by the Leibniz Institute for Psychology Information that primarily document German and English instruments, but also instruments available in multiple languages. Our lab, a laboratory for research of individual differences at the University of Belgrade, has established an open access repository called Repopsy, where you can find instruments in Serbian, English, as well as, as in other languages. Some researchers also maintain websites dedicated to specific instruments, and you can also find translations that way. There are also some other catalogs, such as the Decision-Making Individual Differences Inventory and the Science of Behavior Change Measures. These repositories are not focused on translations, but can prove to be a useful resource and you can browse them for external links where translations could be stored. Uh, and before you decide if you want to reuse any of the existing translations, make sure to check the terms of use and see if you need to contact the authors for permission to use their instruments or translation. When it comes to your own translations and adaptations, it is never too early to start thinking about how you are going to store all of those different documents. You should manage your data well, whether it's just for personal use or whether you want your colleagues at the lab or the public to be able to reuse it in the future. So I will now go over some good practices that are easy to adopt and will help you manage your research data. First, you should keep sufficient documentation on the instrument. Ask yourself what you or your team uh, will need to know in a year from now. So document things such as the authors and the year of translation, citation, what translation methods you used, exact wording of the instructions and items, response categories, scoring and item recoding procedures, uh, what is the purpose of the instrument, for which target population it was developed. Then you can document the survey mode for which it was developed, for example, if the instrument is web-based or paper and pencil. You can also document if, if uh, reliability and validity was assessed. So these details get forgotten over time, 
so proper documentation can mean the difference in being able to use an older instrument or not. Another good practice is to organize folders and subfolders in a logical way or in a way in which you would like to search for translations. Also, properly naming the files is important. And uh, try to keep the file names short and avoid special characters. Also, some programs don't easily deal with spaces in file names, so opt to use dashes or underscores over spaces. And here, being consistent is key. So, it would be useful to prepare a file naming convention. And that just means to document the rules that you come up for file naming. Some templates are on this slide, so you can, for example, put instrument abbreviation first in the file name, then underscore, then document target population, another underscore, and then put a short language code. Another good practice is to adopt file versioning. You would want to keep different copies of a file as it changes over time. This is useful, for example, for different versions of the instrument during the translation procedure, or if the instrument changes when it is standardized or further adapted for a certain country or population. And you can indicate these different versions by adding it to the file name for example, you can add an underscore and v1.1 for a first version. Next good practice is to back up your files. And don't do all of this work on the translation only to lose the data. And trust me, data loss happens more often than we'd like to believe. You can follow the 3 2, 1 rule. So keep three copies of the data at two geographically separate locations and on more than one type of storage device. It is also useful to schedule your backups and to confirm that the backups are functioning properly from time to time. Finally, think about whether you can deposit your translations into an existing repository for measurement instruments. We talked about some thematic and disciplinary repositories earlier, and you can also consult some registries of repositories to find a suitable one for your instruments and instrument translations. Another option is to create your own repository you can use platforms such as Open Science Framework or Zenodo. They are completely free to use and free of cost. And you can control who can access your materials, so whether they will be private or accessible only to you, or public and accessible to everyone. If you decide to create a repository from scratch, uh, that's usually a bit more work, so you would need a more detailed research data management plan. So spend some extra time thinking about under which license to publish your materials. One license that is often used is a Creative Commons license, which requires others to reuse the materials provided they give credit to the original authors. And reusers can also distribute and adapt the materials, but only for non-commercial purposes. And if they do modify or adapt the material, they must apply the same license to the new material. If you are unsure which license to choose, always check with instrument authors or project coordinators. For example, it might 
turn out you need permission from instrument authors to use or adapt an instrument or it could happen that you can't make the translation of an axis because the original instrument is a commercial instrument that you have to pay to use. Also, think about in which formats you want to store your files. A good practice is to save the data in a more open format that does not need a paid software to open it. So, for example, you can use Open Document or PDF instead of Word documents or comma separated value files instead of Excel files. Adopting these data management practices will make your instruments easier to find and reuse and the risk of losing your data will be lower. These practices will also help you and others interpret your data correctly. You will be able to easily locate different versions of the instrument and understand them and use them throughout all of the stages of a project and in the future. We have now reached the end of the workshop and we hope we have provided you with a better or a more nuanced understanding of the instrument translation and adaptation process. Translation is a crucial part of multi-site projects and is often also a time-consuming task. So this contribution needs to be made more visible and we need to regularly recognize and credit people for doing this work. Through different examples, we showed that there is no solution that works for every instrument or in every project. So weigh the benefits and costs of different approaches carefully while keeping in mind some practical constraints, such as how much time you have to finish the project or how much money is available. And because it would be nice for your translation to make an impact even after the project has ended, think about how you are going to allow others to reuse the translations and prepare a good data management plan. Here is a list of books and articles that we used to prepare this workshop. You might also find them useful if you want to learn more about any of these topics. And here, here are the free resources we used to make our slides look pretty. Thank you for joining our workshop. And if you have any questions or comments, we would be glad to hear from you. Happy instrument translating and adapting.